Hey guys, welcome back to the show. I get emails every single week about this topic we're going to talk about today, and that is mobile home park investing. And for whatever reason, they're so scarce, we're going to learn all about them today. And I've reached out to one of the experts in the field itself, Mr. Ryan Naris. Ryan, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So um, Ryan comes very highly recommended from a friend of mine and I. Uh, we just partnered together on a, a mobile home park deal together. And my friend was telling me all about Ryan. He was in Ryan's mobile home park mentorship. That's where he learned uh, his trade. And I couldn't think of a better person to get on the show than learning from somebody that not only does it himself full time, but teaches it. So Ryan, I um, I know you have a very interesting background and and it starts with getting a, a, a degree in psychology. Mm -hmm. So how does somebody, you know, I've got a, a kid that's going to college next year. So how does somebody with a degree in psychology go to eventually doing mobile home parks full time? How'd you get into that? <laughs> Not a quick answer, but <laughs> if you're a fan of Charlie Munger, who's uh, Warren Buffett's business partner, he had uh, a lot of his philosophy is actually based around mathematics in terms of really a lot of physics and discrete mathematics and psychology. Mm -hmm. And if you read the book, Words of Wisdom, which is really inspired by Charlie Munger, it's, it's twofold. It's math and it's psychology, right? Because business is obviously heavily driven by math. And also people are ultimately what is getting exchanged at the end of the day, right? Exchanges and value is what business is all about. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously people, <laughs> Right. Business is people. Exchanging value is people. So if you understand people, that's going to set you apart. So his big thing was study people. You understand the people, the math, you understand the math. Great. But it's really the, the people and the philosophy behind math, which is obviously the study of patterns. So I wish I could say as an 18 year old entering Wake Forest University, my alma mater, that I was trying to model myself after Charlie Munger. Truth is, I had no idea who that was at the time. And I also had no idea who I was as an 18-year-old. And I think that's really the, the bigger takeaway there is it's okay to not know who you are or what you want to be. The, the really, I think the thing that a lot of people make mistakes of especially a lot of my friends of Indian descent is there's my friends from India all joke. They're like, if you don't know what you want to do, just go be a doctor. Like that's just what they do. That's just what they do. And on the one hand, you want to laugh and be like, Oh, that's funny. But on the other hand, you're like, man, but it's America. Go go be what you want to be. You want to make flower arrangements. Go do that. You want to be a swim instructor. Go do that. And I think for me, Going to college, true story, I wanted to be a stand-up comedian and a physicist. <laughs> so I was originally going to be a physics major with a theater minor. So I was going to be a stand-up comedian on the side, I guess. And then it twisted and turned. And eventually what I, I just kind of took a leap of faith in doing was I went from going from a physics major, which is obviously very hard. And a lot of your listeners probably are sitting back and being like, I went through STEM. Psychology shouldn't really count. <laughs> and to make a pivot from a, a physics major at a good school, Wake Forest University is a good school, to psychology uh, made my mother very upset like what are you gonna come on dude you're not gonna make any money right my dad didn't care my dad is a an educator though so he was always pro go find whatever the heck it is you want to do with your life but i think ultimately what i ended up doing without realizing it was following in the path of charlie munger at least his kind of macro philosophy and trying to find out who i was and what i wanted to do and not listening to people even my own mother for crying out loud 
tell me who I was or what I should and should not be doing. And it took a lot of courage to do that. Not just because of familiar, familial and friend and, you know, close circle pressure. It, it took a lot of internal courage as well, because it's really, really scary to be an entrepreneur. It really is. Uh, we'll get into my backstory in a little bit, but basically I, I ended up going back to Wake Forest University to get my MBA. Mm -hmm. And then I went to work for a wonderful company in Wells Fargo who paid me a wonderful salary and treated me very well. And it was very difficult to walk away from that. And I moved into a mobile home to chase my dreams. And my wife thought I was nuts. <laughs> so, you know, and then my dad literally, so I don't want to just Josh on my wife and, and my mom. Uh, my dad even still to this day jokes that I don't have real money. I have monopoly money. <laughs> so he doesn't even really understand or think it's real you know, but they all love me and support me. So I don't want to say that they're not supportive. They just, they just don't understand. Uh, you know, my wife does now, now she's a 50, 50 business partner with me. It just took her a while to come around, but you know, this is a very, very long, very long winded way of saying I had no idea who I was at 18. I had no idea who I was in my mid twenties. And I think, consider myself lucky to have discovered what it is that I feel like I'm meant to do with my life at about 28 years old. Now I'm 35 going on 36. I find, I, I find myself incredibly lucky. Uh, and for your listeners, I like you most likely had a mountain of student loan debt <laughs> and no money when I graduated from my MBA and you know, no experience, no network. I, I had no millionaires I could call and get a warm response from in 24 hours. And I quit my job and I chased my dreams. And here's why all of this is relevant because uh, I just closed on my 80th property, 8080, 4,200 units, two RV parks, 78 mobile home parks. And let me reiterate this. I had no money, I had no network, and I had no experience. I just was a, a determined kid who was overly educated, overly straddled with student loan debt, and I was just sick and tired of listening to conventional wisdom of what I should and should not do. So I basically just went, hey, I could go and figure this out. I've met a ton of really wealthy people who are very, very much so less educated than I am. And if they can do it, and, and a lot of these knuckleheads I've met who are very wealthy can do it, like, why not me? And I think what I ultimately had to do, doctor, is I ended up having to just develop a lot of courage in myself and faith that I'd figure it out along the way. Let me, let me ask you this. Most of the people that get into real estate, uh, they're wealthy they have a common thread and that's they've heard of rich dad, poor dad, or they have listened to his philosophies, Robert Kiyosaki, any of that cross your path early in the days? Absolutely. That's what I, I discovered in 2012 that I was meant to be an entrepreneur. So as of this recording in January, 2023, it's been about a decade, mm -hmm. which feels like a drop in the bucket if I'm being honest, but I didn't go full time in mobile home parks until 2017. So it took five years after discovering I wanted to start my own business before I actually started one that I could quit and go full time on, which obviously felt forever in, in, in the moment. But in 2012, I decided I wanted to own my own business and it took me three years to find mobile home parks. And I was actively looking. I looked at over a hundred businesses to start. I started three, all three went nowhere. Two of them actually lost me money. And this was while you were at Wells Fargo, you were looking. No. So uh, this was 2012 to 2015. And I didn't start Wells Fargo until 2016. So this was a little bit before Wells Fargo, okay. but between undergrad and starting my MBA, which I was an MBA from 2014 to 2016, okay. I was actively looking for businesses to start, started three, two of which lost me money. One of which was just didn't go anywhere. And I was actively looking and it wasn't until, it wasn't until 
I decided I was going to challenge myself to read 50 books a year. So a book a week, basically. Mm -hmm. And Rich Dad, Poor Dad was on that list. Everybody talks about it. And when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I went, no, this is it. I'm meant to be in real estate. So Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Kiyosaki, mind-blowing, very heavy influence. And he kind of, what his book did was, was introduce me to real estate as an entrepreneurial venture and, <clears throat> and really made me realize that my true passion, my true calling in life was in real estate. So yes, very, very much so. What what I love about the book and and your story and to tie it into one of my sons who is a senior this year, he's going to college next year. I was raised, you probably were too, was the Kiyosaki's poor dad philosophy. Yep. You know, if, if you if you want to, you know, I I finished co uh, high school in '92, so I'm I got about a decade ahead of you. But back then, it was like you know, there was no internet, cell phones, you know, there was none of this stuff where you can just go learn online, be a YouTube billionaire at 17. It was, you you know, you, you go to school, you study hard, make good grades, go to college. If you really want to make good money, you go beyond college, doctor, lawyer, dentist, you know, something like that, be specialized even further. That was it back then. You know, and then now I've got, you know, my son's graduating. He's like, like, you know what? You don't really have to go to college if you don't want, you know, if you don't want to. I mean, he does. And he he's looking at, at some things. He, he's a quarterback and he's thinking about maybe trying to get on with a smaller school. But still, I mean, it's so wide open now, which and, and I'm just constantly talking to both of them just introducing the entrepreneurial concepts you know to them it and, was always there yeah it was always there it's just easier to find now the barriers of yeah. entry have come crumbling down so you and, so you read the book it, you were like i'm meant to be real estate so that's when you honed in on mobile home parks or were there other other different types of assets you looked at before so what I love about books and education in general is for 20 bucks, you can have somebody's some absolute experts, life's wisdom condensed in a very palatable, very easy to consume, entertaining medium. So yeah. it's unbelievable how much ROI is in a book. So Rich Dad, Poor Dad tilted me in the direction of hey, real estate is it. I've got to say, there's a lot of other books I could talk about that really influenced me and changed my mindset. Mm -hmm. But I got to say specifically where I found mobile home parks was a book called The Millionaire Next Door. And in The Millionaire Next Door, there's there's two books that that author came about. But in The Millionaire Next Door, he specifically mentioned mobile home parks and i have to go back and reread that i don't i don't remember him mentioning that tom staley stanley that sounds correct yes okay. and i remember oh, reading that and, and being like okay wow a mobile home park because this was i can't remember what year i read it but i remember 2012 or 2013 maybe 2014 and i just remember reading that and going a mobile home park there's a million, there's someone, a millionaire could live in a mobile home, in a mobile home park, pay off the debt and just sit there and collect mm. money from rent. And I, I'm like doing the math. I'm like, gosh, you can make over a hundred K a year debt free and have no expenses. I was like, all you have to do is get over the fact that it's a mobile home. Oh my gosh, sign me up. So Rich Dad, Poor Dad pointed me in the direction of, of real estate. Millionaire Next Door pointed me in the direction of, of mobile home parks. And then again, we could talk for hours about great books I read that help influence me. But those are probably the two biggest that got me to specifically to mobile home parks. Okay, so walk me through the when, when okay, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm all in, I'm going mobile home parks. What did that transition look like out that was out of Wells Fargo into that? What are maybe some of the steps that you took to get to that first point? I'm going to do my best not to be a highlight reel. 
So uh, this is like the one thing that you just have to know as a listener is that I'm going to make it sound quick and easy. It was hard, arduous, and I never knew if it was going to work out. Okay. But 2012, I discovered I wanted to be an entrepreneur. 2015, after looking at over 100 businesses, feeling like I was never going to get anywhere or find anything, I lost money on two ventures and I didn't have a lot of money to begin with. And it was hopeless. And three years is a long time when you're not, when you're losing money and you don't even know if you're ever going to find it. It's kind of like trying to find a spouse. You got a whole lot of really awful dates that are expensive and they're fine people. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying like the women I dated weren't wonderful humans. They were, we just weren't good fits for each other. And then one day you find your wife. Mm -hmm. And my wife hates when I say that because she's like, you're basically comparing me to a mobile home park. <laughs> like, sweetie, but mobile home parks are great. <laughs> uh, but, you know, one day it just, it hit. And I, I when I found it and when I found a, a path to get into it, everything made sense. So that was 2015 when it went, oh my goodness, not only have I, you know, I heard about mobile home parks, but I, and I was like, that's a good idea, but I didn't want to explore it yet. So it took me really three years to go to take a really serious, hard look at mobile home parks. And then I kind of took a year to really try to figure out how to get in the space. So it took me nine months to even find a deal I wanted to buy. And then it took another X amount of time to find money because I didn't have any. And then there are problems like your deal. local area you were looking at, like you would physically go look. My first deal was in was outside of Durham, North Carolina. So I was in Winston Salem, North Carolina, uh, in 2015, okay. in 2016, completing my MBA. So Durham is nothing. You just hop on I-40. So our first ever deal we put under contract, I think it was March of 2016, and we hit hiccup after hiccup after hiccup. We didn't have closing until September. So I had already graduated and moved back to Charlotte, North Carolina, to work at Wells Fargo. So it took me a while between finding the deal, finding the money, getting the deal across the finish line. But the the problem was it, it didn't pay enough for me to leave Wells Fargo. I ended up doing my next deal in January of 2017, still not enough money. And then I ended up going full time really at the end of slash start of end of June 2017, start of July 2017. So how really, big the, how big were those two parks? Do you remember? Uh, the first one we did was 89 lots, like 60 or so occupied. The second one was 33. Okay. So small. So not enough to really go full time. Mm -hmm. And then our third one, I, I was looking at a pro forma. And I went, wait a minute. It says on-site manager. You know, uh, combine all the in income, it's like $35,000 a year. And I went, wait a second. What if I just was the property manager? What if I just moved into the mobile home park and had no living expenses? What if I just lived on a shoestring budget, got myself out of a really nice middle class lifestyle, just bit the bullet for X number of years, moved into a mobile home, and just chased my dream? And I said, look, if my ridiculously expensive MBA is worth anything other than the piece of paper it's on, then if I fail here, in theory, I just go get another job, right? That's what it's for. And if not, then that was a huge sham. <laughs> and shame on me. And I, it, you know, it was really scary because every, my dad was poor dad. For, my dad was an educator. Like his philosophies match that. Now my dad did incredibly well and I'm not knocking him. He's he's found his way in the upper middle class and he's retiring debt free with a great nest egg. But it took him decades. You know, my dad's twice my age and I have all of that now. And the reason was, is because I did something incredibly bold. I quit, I, I quit the middle class. I quit conventionality and I did something most people find excuses for. Oh, I got kids. Oh, I got debt. Oh, I got a mortgage. Oh, you know, yada, yada, yada. I am not willing to blah. And the truth of the matter is I have kids. 
I wasn't willing to do that. Ask my wife. She used a lot of very uh, choice words that were not SAT words <laughs> to voice her displeasure about moving into a mobile home at first. And now if you asked her, she would she will tell you in a second, if we lost it all today, we'd be in a mobile home tomorrow because she's seen it now. She just needed to see it. Mm -hmm. And I needed to see it too. And what my wife had the luxury of that I did not is she had me explaining all of these things to her, showing her. I had to go and learn those myself because I did not have multimillionaire friends when I started out. I had not read books from very successful people. I had to go out and self-educate and and build up my own courage to even do all of this. So it took me a long time to self-educate. And my wife, again, is the beneficiary of having someone close to her who's already done all of those things, read all those books, made all that sacrifice. So as a rational human being, she's like, oh yeah, of course, duh, let's, yes, let's go. So she, I love her so much for, again, 50-50 business partners now, and and it works for us. And, it, and she's, if something happened to me, I fully trust her to not only continue to run what we have but take it to the next level so yeah. she like me just needed to go through the mental process of of making of beating out the middle class and welcoming in the mindset of 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 rich dad which is again what's so beautiful about that but getting back to your your initial question here how did what did it look like well Look, 2015, I discovered mobile home parks, really took a hard look and said, this is what I want to do. But that was three years in the making. And by the way, 2012, I, I'm, before that, I was still trying to discover who I was. So there were skills I was building. There were people I was meeting. There was all sorts of things I was doing even before 2012. So when I get to 2015 and I decide mobile home parks, even then it takes a year to really buy my over a year to buy my first and then another full year to have enough scale to go full time and even full time looked like living on a blow up mattress paying myself $35,000 a year to scale a portfolio and and when I did that doctor oh my gosh I literally lost 15 pounds changed nothing about my lifestyle in terms of diet and exercise I lost 15 pounds of sad weight sad weight. Not that Wells Fargo wasn't a wonderful company to work for. Not that I, I literally still have friends that I met there to this day. It just, it was, I was not meant to be there. And that made me sad. And when I was sad, I guess I was eating more, you know, mm -hmm. just, like literally sad weight. But anyways, 18 months later, I was back in the middle-class lifestyle. So 18 months of living, you know, off and on between mobile homes, uh, I am back in the middle class lifestyle. I, I found a way to pay myself, you know, a little more than thirty five thousand dollars a year. A couple of years later, I finally gave myself a raise to sixty. And the last two years, my income has been unbelievable. Like, I, if I told myself when I was starting out, I wouldn't have believed it. So the reason why I wanted to take a little bit more time to explain that is, I want folks to know, like if you listen to my story and you're like, oh yeah, it was like, you know, eight years start to finish. Yeah. But the amount of sacrifice and courage and education, I taught myself a foreign language for crying out loud. Like I don't have any Spanish friends. I literally just bootlegged it myself using the Duolingo app. The amount of things I, I sacrificed and committed myself to learning and growing is uh, not really captured if I just kind of hit you with the highlights so long-winded way of saying follow your dreams it'll make you way happier than um following what you know society is telling you to go do yeah and i've i've got um I, if i can get the the student right out of college you know before they go to medical school or dental school just to what you said you you made it a point to read 50 books a year well you were you were getting ready you were training to eventually become an entrepreneur, uh, financial, you know, you know, you, you know, money more, you know, finances, I'm sure you know, taxes more. But what happens is these guys, they, they're so focused on studying and doing good and treating patients. And then they get out, they're making all this money. 
And then they look up five, seven, 10 years later and they're burned out and they're like, well, I, I don't know how to do anything else. Yep. And, and if I could say, look, while you're training to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, take 10 books a year instead yep. of being on Snapchat or Instagram three, four hours a day, you know, maybe a book a month. And just to learn. And then once you do get out, probably one of the best things I ever did was about five years ago, I spent $500 on an online course, how to start a blog. And that is completely, that's why you and I are here right now, because I would have been working till I was 65 or 70, 401k, one stream of income. And now, you know, I'm able to grow a group, you know, bring bring education like you and other people to, to educate people on you need real estate and you need multiple streams of income if you want to be wealthy, right? So there, there's so many different asset classes out there. There's hotels, apartments, self-storage, um, medical office buildings. And, you know, people are always asking me, what should I invest in or how do I decide Somebody were to come to you and say, why mobile home parks, in your opinion, as asset class, what would you say? Look, I would say that if, if you want to do mobile home parks, like you want to be a general partner, there is nothing better in terms of, in my opinion, nothing better in terms of the why, because what you're in effect doing is you are raising the quality of affordable housing and you are preserving affordable housing so we're seeing more attrition of mobile home parks than addition meaning they're not getting developed they just aren't more of them are getting redeveloped into something else every year than are getting built so there's a limited supply they're the hot commodity right now we can talk about all the financial metrics right bonus depreciation accelerated depreciation opportunity zones, uh, high margins, high, high margins, like you, uh, mom and pop operations that just run their, some of, in some cases, run them like absolute slums. So they give you just a mountain of things you could really bring true good value to folks and in exchange, raise the rent to something fair. So there's a lot of lucrative reasons we could talk about, but you know, if you're really going to be a general partner, I would say, gosh, the the ability to preserve and enhance affordable housing is what makes me get up and get excited every single morning. Because eventually, you get desensitized to the money. It's it's just, it, it, Doctor, I'm boring. I like hang out with my kids and play Pokemon Go and watch sports. That's all I do. I don't need like a house in the Bahamas. I don't even really want one. I don't even want a beach house. My wife's like, should we go to beach house? I'm like, yeah, no, right? Like I just, money is is a tool to, that you can go and and do things with. And to me, I like to do good things with it. So that's kind of my philosophy. Now, if you're a limited partner, so again, I want to preface this. There is nothing wrong with being a dentist or a surgeon or a lawyer and being that being your only focus. Because if you read books like, mastery by robert green the big thing is like get your ten thousand hours in the one thing great book pick one thing you want to be really good at and just make it a point to spend at least four hours a day on it you mm -hmm. know so you can still do your instagram and your snapchat and all that jazz but like spend four hours on whatever it is you want which is a big reason another good influence on why i quit and went full time is i read the one thing and i was like oh my gosh what am i doing working out corporate america i should just go chase my dreams that can be my one thing. And eventually it'll work out. I just have faith that it'll work out one day. So if you're, you know, a limited partner, mm -hmm. it's okay to remain a dentist or a lawyer, whatever it is that you're doing. If you're a limited partner, reasons why you might consider mobile home parks beyond just the why that I talked about is that the returns and depreciation are really attractive. So the way the US government uh, for the most part works the overwhelming majority of tax bills are written so you don't have to pay taxes. So in other words, why? So let's break that down. Why? 
Well, the answer is the government wants to incentivize certain economic behavior. And one thing the government, at least the politicians really squawk about all the time is we don't have enough affordable housing. So what do they do? They offer insane tax benefits to people who are in affordable housing. So again, if you're all about the money, if you're not into the why like I am, there's nothing wrong with that. Mobile home parks, they ain't going nowhere um, if they're done right. The tax benefits, depending on how you do your taxes, you may not qualify for any of that depreciation, by the way. So don't get excited about it. Go and buy one or invest in one and then be shocked when it doesn't happen. You got to check with your CPA. But you know, if the why doesn't sell you on it, supporting affordable housing, let me tell you, when done right, ethically, legally, all that jazz, the tax benefits can be enormous and the margins can be really, really good. Uh, so in other words, if you're willing to just find someone you really believe in, because I, I want to throw this out there too, you, you brought this up, which is spot on. People who are laser focused on getting through med school, then they make all this money. They have a sudden wealth event, if you will. Then they go, oh my gosh, I have all this money. How do I invest it? Right? That's a skill. It turns out as a, a general partner in mobile home parks, I am having to learn how to be a limited partner in mobile home parks. I don't know. I don't even, I literally do this on the GP side. And I'm like, gosh, I need to go learn how to be an LP because I've never done it. So I, I'll tell you, I don't want to like make you fearful, but what I'll say is like, it's a skill and you need to go learn it. And you have a really big responsibility because if you pick the wrong operator, it could cost you big time. So you know, whether you're on the GP side or the LP side, like know that it doesn't really matter if it's mobile home parks or self-storage or hotels or office, you got to pick a good operator, period. And finding one and really vetting one out is it and the opportunity to, that takes skill. So money and the why, both are really strong. Yeah, most of the people that are that are listening to this, you know, they have their full-time gig. Uh, they're looking for ways to get other streams of income. They want to take the active income, turn it into passive income. A lot of them always, you know, it's always some sort of event that's caused it. You know, for me, we were snow skiing about seven, eight years ago. I fell, I hurt my wrist. That was my wake up call. Hey, if Jeff can't use his hands, he can't feed his kids. That never even crossed my mind. You know, at 38 years old or something, whenever that happened, you know, just about your age, you know, it's like, you know, if I hurt my wrist and I worked at Wells Fargo, well, I would pick up the phone with the other hand and I can make my calls or whatever. But you know what? That that don't happen in my field. And and I did it. I solely started focusing not for the money. It was more of an insurance policy. You know, I did have a disability insurance policy, but that, that ain't gonna last forever. Right. So it's like I've got to have other streams of income coming in. And it really was nice during the pandemic when who, who knew that the state board would call us and go, oh, by the way, as of two days from now, you you can't practice your, your career until we say so. Mm. That's scary. Mm. You know, that's scary. I that was scary for a lot of people. And that, and I, and I'm um, on a lot of these forums online with physicians and dentists. And during that time period, and you could see just the fear in a lot of them, like, Hey, it, as soon as I get, as soon as I get back to work, I'm paying off all my debt. I'm never going to have a credit card anymore. I'm going to do this. So it really helped. It was a wake up call for a lot of people. Yep. And that's, that's why I'm really wanting to get people like you and educational material and just educate people that there's other ways to skin a cat. You don't have to completely rely on your income. You can invest for cash flow and the cat and the tax benefits. And mobile home parks are a great way to do it. And I'll say that there's more than just mobile home parks too. So RV parks are great. Self storage, office when done right can be great. Mm -hmm. I've had a very unfortunate bout in the emergency room the last twelve months. My wife's gone. I've gone. We just had a new baby. And I'm going to tell you to have, oh, and then some of our latest acquisitions haven't been going as lucratively out of the gate as we were hoping. We're always going to do the right thing and make sure our residents are taken care of, even if that means we take losses. And so we've had to take losses on 
got a half dozen or so properties, which is fine at the end of the day for a whole lot of reasons. But at the end of the day, I can be in the emergency room, whether it's myself in the hospital bed, my wife or whomever, and it's okay because I am a limited partner in a whole bunch of stuff. I'm a general partner and even more. And I have a team and a machine and I can step away for a little bit and that's okay. And, and that's funny you mentioned the skiing accident. I was actually in sales before I got my MBA. And that's when I was kind of going through going like, gosh, you know, I need to make a push to try to figure out who I am and where I want to go next. And in 2012, before I really committed myself, or maybe it was 2011, before I committed myself to reading all these books and pursuing an entrepreneur and discovering I, I was meant to be an entrepreneur, I sprained my ankle playing basketball. I was like, I don't know, 23, 24 years old, I sprained my ankle. And in sales, I couldn't sell unless I wanted to show up in crutches, which by the way, I did. Because I was like, I'm commission only. I can't be at home right now with a sprained ankle. And that was a, a big impetus for me to just, I can't, I can't wait. Even though I'm in my twenties, I got, you know, in theory, plenty of time left. Mm -hmm. You got to start now. You got to start now because one day it's not going to be a sprained ankle. It's going to be a hip replacement or my knees go out or I'm just tired and my body's starting to fail me. So yeah, there's, yeah, I, I feel you on that. That was my moment. I had it early. So if people want to learn more about you, I know you have a podcast, uh, where, where can they go to do that? Yes, I have a podcast. It's called Mobile Home Parks in Real Life. So that's M-H-P-I-R-L. And I stress the in real life portion. Mobile Home Parks are one of the most unbelievably overhyped spaces that are also unbelievably misunderstood mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons. And what it does is it kind of attracts the wrong element. So what I've done with my podcast is I give out all of my wisdom for free. I don't sell anything. I don't ask you for LP money for my deals. I literally just put everything out there for free in the hope that what will happen is it'll go a bit viral and people will at least, you know, if you want to get drunk on the hype story of mobile home parks, fine. But at least you have an option of a real unbiased opinion on how hard this space can be. It's a GP and an LP. So my podcast, Mobile Home Parks in Real Life, it is all content. It is all actionable wisdom. It is all free. I don't need anything from you. And by the way, I'm not raising funds. I syndicate all my deals with friends and family. If you if you want to get in touch with me because you have questions I, for free, I don't need anything from you. Reach out. My big thing is I want to be a bastion of good, clean information about affordable housing because whether you know it or not, we have an affordable housing crisis in this country and its ancillary effects are enormous. The, the big reason why I actually wanted to do mobile home parks is a little bit unexpected. So from a very young age, I had a learning disability and my folks had, I was poor dad, right? So my dad was an educator. So my dad was very, very much so like I'm getting my kid through school. So he had the means, the money and the time and the patience to invest in me. Tutors, medications, the works, SAT classes, and I did reasonably well. Wake Forest University might not be an Ivy League school, but it's a pretty darn good school. I have my parents to thank for, for that. At a really young age, I realized I was insanely lucky because when I was doing charity work, I met a, a little girl who I was tutoring and I could tell she was really smart and needed like, this much like literally just somebody sit next to her while she does her homework and she was just picking on it like that and but the thing that sat with me that was weird is I was like this little girl is in this tutoring program because she's behind and I'm sitting here like how is this what the little girl behind 
She is picking up on things. She is so smart and clever. All she needs is a warm body next to her. Oh, I get it. She's coming from poverty where her parents might not care about her or she's raised by someone, uh, you know, a committee of people or she's in foster care or she's this that, and the other thing. Meanwhile, I'm learning disability coming from a middle-class family who cares. Not that her parents don't care or this that, the other thing, but the amount of attention I got was needed to get me there. The amount of attention she needed was like this much, but she may not get it. And that talent and that intellect may completely go to waste or worse, go to crime, go to crime. And that humbled me at a really young age hmm. because I went, gosh, if I didn't have my parents, I might be a criminal. And that never left me. And what made mobile home parks so appealing to me and why I'm just gung ho about it is because one big reason why these kids don't get their education and wind up in crime is because their parents are too stressed out working three jobs and not being able to afford to pay for anything. And they're moving every 18 months or less, or they're, you know, raising a kid by committee and it affects our entire community. So for me, like, I, when I say this, people are like, oh, come on, dude, you want something from me. You're selling education or raising money or this. No, I believe if I encourage good people, good entrepreneurs, good would-be entrepreneurs to get off the sidelines and get in the game and do, the, do right by people in affordable housing, I think we can improve our communities on the whole. We can get kids better education. And in a very, very unexpected uh, way, that's what got me excited about mobile home park investing. So if you're listening, come find me. I'm very passionate. I will give you my time and my wisdom for free. Just use this, those powers for good, please. Ladies so, and gentlemen, I'm Ryan Neris. Please come, come find me. I'd, I'd love to connect. Mobile home parks and real life podcasts. Guys, we'll put the link below this it was very uh great spending this time with you um i'm sure after we get the tremendous amount of questions that probably come in and comments more than likely i'll probably reach out if you don't mind and we'll do a, sure. another episode that they may want to know more about depreciation and tax benefits and in, in mobile home parks i don't know we'll see what happens but again thank you for your time and um We'll put the link below the video. Thanks for having me.